Um, as usual, I'm not planning on a final exam. Um, on the other hand, uh, we could, if you want, and I'm, I'm leaving it up to you, have a class, a last lecture, instead of the final exam. Or we could just blow away the final exam. So um, would you guys like another lecture? So how far do you plan to get today? I don't know. I actually, I, my memory of, I, I plan to follow my archive notes on supersymmetry. Yeah. By the way, there's a sad story about that. I, um, I uploaded to the archive these notes from years ago, and years ago, then worked for another couple of months developing the notes. And then a colleague of mine put a new operating system on my computer and erased the hard drive, and I hadn't saved a copy of the note. So I lost two months at least work on this procedure. And, um, anyway, I downloaded the notes and um, looked at them today, and unfortunately, although they basically are self-contained, they're, um, they use the dotted and undotted notation, which I think is needlessly complicated. Um, but it's hard then to undot the notes. Um, what I plan to do to begin with is supersymmetric quantum mechanics, which is a lovely story. And in fact, uh, it has, it, it, it may have some interest, it has some interesting applications because, of course, quantum mechanics is still a lively subject and the number of systems that one can do exactly is fairly limited. Um, but if you require the theory to be supersymmetric, then it's much easier to um, find at least the ground state. And probably the more excited, the excited states also. So let me start with that and we can at the end of the hour, maybe we can decide whether we want another lecture on supersymmetry or not. You may decide that you will have had enough of supersymmetry by the time I finish. Okay, supersymmetric quantum mechanics was invented by someone named Nikolai and also and independently by Whitten. And the idea is this, we've got a, uh, a Hamiltonian H, and then we've got some charges, which we'll call Q sub I. And the idea is that these charges commute with the Hamiltonian, I equals one, two, however many there happen to be. Um, I have here dot 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 N, and um, the idea is that the anti-commutator of any two of these supercharges is zero unless it's the same supercharge. So these supercharges all anti-commute. But if it's the same supercharge, this is just twice the square of the supercharge. And that, the magic is that that's H. And this is sort of a, this is the, the quantum mechanical analog of what happens in uh, quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, you have charges, but instead of just being charges, they're spinners. And so they have an index here, and a spinner index, a space-time index. And now the anti-commutator is basically uh, some Pauli matrices dotted into the four momentum. So it's, an, it's, it's very much similar, but um, obviously more general. 
Now, um, in the simplest case here, uh, and in fact the case that I'm going to examine, I'm going to illustrate, I just takes two values, one and two. And but that already is, is quite interesting. It really is quite interesting. Um, all right. Um, obviously, since this is a supersymmetric theory, we'll be talking about uh, a quantum mechanical system that has some spin. And so the psi of x has two components, which is x spin up psi and x spin down psi. So this is our spinner. This is sort of the usual quantum mechanical notation. And I'm going to call this psi 1 of x, psi 2 of x. I put these notes on the web page, and I even added something to them. Um, by the way, in case one of you is a, uh, a real LaTeX ace, um, when I try to edit to, to add, add some simplifying uh, material here. I used a modern version, of course, of LaTeX, and I had begin P matrix, end P matrix. And then I ran the thing, and of course it didn't work, so I had to add a line, you know, include file, uh, use package and AMS tech and so forth. When I ran that, it objected to all the old way that I did uh, the matrices because I just had backslash matrix, curly bracket, blah, 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 curly bracket. Does anybody know of some simple way of making it compatible or? Uh, okay, anyway. Now let me tell you what the charges are. Q1 is a half. Sigma 1 P over the square root of m, p of course is the momentum operator. We have obviously xp is i h bar. And in fact, I'm using unnatural units today uh, for the quantum mechanical example. And on the other hand, I probably have left out several factors of h bar because I'm not used to unnatural units. Notice this W of X. This W of X shows up uh, a lot in supersymmetry. In general, it's an analytic function, but at the moment, let's just call it W. And then Q2 is a half sigma 2P over the square root of M minus sigma 1 square root of M W of X. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I guess that's clear. So these are the two charges. And um, obviously, the sigmas of the Pauli matrices and um, the Pauli matrices are sigma i, sigma. is um, 2 delta i j and or writing it more simply sigma i sigma j is delta i j plus 2 i epsilon i j k sigma k. I think that's, I, I think I've done, I'm, I'm doing that from memory rather than reading my notes so it's, it's a little bit suspicious. Anyway, x P psi, of course, is h bar over i uh, d by dx psi of x. So that's just the standard. I'm not doing anything tricky here. Notice these things are Hermitian there. But w is real. Uh, and uh, the Pauli matrices are Hermitian. And uh, P is Hermitian. So Q1 and Q2 are permission. So we can say my value equals.
Okay, now, this W is called the superpotential. I want to do one de Blasio at least. There. By the way, the, um, I don't know if any of you followed this, but um, I happen to listen to C-SPAN a lot. I heard Hillary's speech at Columbia University yesterday. Quite a good speech, actually. The best I've ever heard of it. The best part of her speech, though, was when she quoted a certain theoretical physicist whom I actually referred to in footnote one, Jay Bagger, Jonathan Bagger. And um, what she quoted was that he, he uh, I remember him saying once when he was a postdoc at Harvard, he said, I asked him what he was working on, and he said, well, he really wanted to work on something or other, but he had to work on strings, because if he didn't work on strings, you couldn't get a job. This was back 20 years ago. And so anyway, he got a job at Johns Hopkins. And rather quickly became uh, the vice provost or provost. And in 2013, he gave a talk in which he pointed out there were two suburbs in Baltimore, at Johns Hopkins, I should say. And uh, he pointed out there were two suburbs in Baltimore that were six miles apart, but the life expectancy, the average life expectancy in the two suburbs differed by 20 years. And so this was a, an example of inequality. And by the way, Piketty points out that in general, wealth inequality is much greater than income inequality. And you can, you can see that if you have one function greater than another and you integrate the two, the difference might be bigger. Anyway. Well, also this you know, compound interest investments and so forth. Anyway, I'm sorry for these, for these digressions. Super potential W of X. And what is it? Well, it's any, we'll start out just by saying the W of X goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. And we want to do that because if we have a potential that looks like this, then the spectrum is discrete. If instead the spectrum looks like this, I'm trying to sort of give you an example of something like that, then uh, you've got a continuous system above the place where the potential is. Uh, above the highest point of potential. Now, um, what I want to show you is what the um, anti-commutator say of Q1 to Q1 is. And um, I think I'll do this explicitly. What is that? Well, it's, it's of course, just uh, twice the square of Q1. And um, so it's twice. 1 over 2 squared, because we're going to square Q1. And then what we will have is sigma 1p over square root of m plus sigma 2 square root of m w squared. And so let me, well, I think we can just say squared. I need to write it out. Squared. So what is this? This is 1 half. Sigma 1 squared is 1. This is p squared over m. I'm just, I'm just a little worried that we're going to get too many. But, but anyway, right, p squared over m. Then what is this thing squared? Well, sigma 2 squared is 1. So this is plus m w squared. And then we've got this uh, slightly confusing term, which would be um, sigma 1, sigma 2, the m's cancel, pw plus sigma 2, sigma 1, the m's cancel, uh, wp. So this is an anti-commutator of p with w. And um, 
On the other hand, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 2, sigma 1, one is the opposite of the other, so this thing is really commutative. So this is equal to p squared over 2m plus mw squared over 2, and sigma 1, sigma 2 is i sigma 3, so this is i sigma 3, the commutator of p with w. Right. And so that is p squared over 2m plus m w squared over 2. And now this is um, h bar over i grad, or h bar, uh, h bar over i um, differentiating. And so this is plus h bar sigma 3 w prime. So the i's cancel and the h bars. And um, you can also show that um, Q2, Q2 is also um, uh, H. And uh, the H in question then is this structure here, P squared over 2M, and then a potential that has a very special form. It's W squared over 2, and then this funny thing that involves spin and a derivative. And this is what's special about this uh, example. On the other hand, you can also show that Q1 and Q2 anti-commute and oh, let's see, is that easy to see? Um, well, you can see that these terms will end up here with each other because it would be, you'd get p squared sigma 1, sigma 2 plus sigma 2, sigma 1, 0. Uh, over here you can also see the anti-commutative advantage would be sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 1, sigma 2, 0. What may be a little bit um, more confusing is this one times that one, why is that? Um, sigma 1, sigma 1 is 1. Sigma 2 is sigma 2 is 1. No, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're right. That's, um, that's certainly 0. Ah, yeah, maybe that's the whole thing then. Because, um, all right, so we, the cross terms, in other words, just um, cancel exactly. As you point out, sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, you've got an extra minus on it. Okay, so um, this, is the super, this is called the supersymmetry algebra in quantum mechanics, for quantum mechanics, and it has this is quite nice. So, is, do you think a W prime is a force? That's a W prime. Right, is that like a force? DW dx. Is that like a force? A fourth? Force. force. Oh! Force. Well, um, the force would be the derivative of the whole thing, would be the classic okay. force. Because the whole potential is W squared and then this funny thing involving spin. Now, notice that there are some magical features of this. Um, that's the funny thing about supersymmetry. There are some things about it that are very attractive, and then there are a lot of disappointments. And um, so I'm waiting down. Uh, well, it will be settled by experiment. We can hope in the next few months or few years. All right. Um, notice that 
what do we have? We have, suppose we have a state size 0 of x such that qi size 0 of x equals 0. So this is a state that's annihilated by one of the supercharges. Well then, it's also true that qi squared psi 0 of x equals 0. But this is just h over 2. So that means that any state that's annihilated by the supercharge is a state that um, has energy 0. Now that's one of the really attractive thing about supersymmetry because you can imagine if you're dealing with quantum field theory, all of this basically, much of this car carries over. The flavor carries over and um, much of the exact, some of the exact relations uh, carry over. In the case of um, uh, quantum field theory, you have a similar relation. You have supercharges. If they annihilate some state, then that state has energy zero. And of course, in the case of quantum field theory, if you have a, a general bosonic field, the ground state of that theory has energy that's infinity to the fourth power. You have a fermion field the ground state of the theory has energy minus infinity to the fourth power. But if the theory is supersymmetric, then the ground state has energy zero. And what's going on is you have a boson and a fermion, their ground state energies cancel, and so you have energy exactly zero. So one of the attractive things about supersymmetric quantum field theory then is that the, uh, if, if supersymmetry is exact, then there's a state that has energy zero. And if you look out at the universe, well, it's basically empty. Um, of course, when supersymmetry was really, uh, was original, in the early years of supersymmetry's popularity, let's say, people didn't know about dark energy. And so they thought the, the energy was essentially zero. And so that was a, a great approximation. But even with dark energy, uh, dark energy is some small number to the, the energy density is some small number in, um, it's I think milli electron volts to the fourth power is the energy density. And so um, on the scale of grand unification, which is 10 to the 16th GeV, or infinity to the fourth, or infinity to the fourth, um, milli electron volts to the fourth seem very small, and so zero is an approximation for unbroken supersymmetry. Exact supersymmetry is very attractive. Unfortunately, when you break it, you get back to the infinity, uh, you get back to very large values. Although it's not, I shouldn't say that. It's actually um, still better. Um, and I'll, I'll get to, should I get to that now? All right, in supersymmetry, in supersymmetric theory, if it's exact, uh, the energy of the ground state is zero. If it's not exact, it's still true if it's a broken supersymmetry, broken in some reasonable way, then um, there are the same number of boson fields as fermion fields. And so the worst divergence, the quartic divergence is gone, and the worst you could have would be a quadratic divergence. So it might be infinity squared, not infinity to the fourth power. Um, So now, um, what we've seen is that um, that if we have a state here that uh, uh, is annihilated by one charge, then uh, it has energy zero. 
In fact, so, so let us let us suppose that Q1 annihilates psi zero. Let me just show you that Q2 also does because Q2 zero, Q2 uh, psi zero, and I'm using a certain sort of um, notation to the inner product, okay, of the two states. In other words, the integral dq dx of, of dx, since it's one dimension of psi two acting on that, and summed over the spins. This thing is psi zero. Q2 dagger Q2, psi zero, but that's psi zero H, psi zero, so this is certainly also zero. So if one charge annihilates the vacuum, so does the other. Um, I guess it would have been simpler just to say H is Q1 squared, is 2Q1 squared, is 2Q2 squared, so if, if H since h on that is zero for q1, it's also h implies a q2. All right, anyway. Um, we can define a transformation, in fact, a unitary operator, e to the minus i theta i qi. So this is a charge, this is a unitary transformation and it uh, generates, we can say it generates a supersymmetry transformation because these are supersymmetric charges. And um, so if we have, let me use the ordinary Dirac notation here. If we have, say, psi zero, psi zero, and um, some sort of in this case, the, the only operators in this case are x and p, and so we would have an x and a p here, and an x and a p there, and they might be at different times. Okay, so two, one, different times. We could then do the following, psi zero, um, e to the minus i, theta i, Qi psi zero e to the i theta i qi and then xp one and then we could do these two things e to the minus i theta i qi e to the i theta i qi xp two and then here we would have the same thing. Um, e to the minus i theta i qi e to the i theta i qi. Obviously, I didn't leave enough space. Um, but the point is that um, since the q's, since qi psi zero is zero, e to the minus i theta i qi on the state psi zero, to write it in direct notation, is just psi zero. So we can rewrite this thing as psi zero e to the minus i theta i qi xp two e to the i theta i qi e to the minus i theta i qi x p one say e to the i theta i qi and now just psi zero. So in other words, now that I've left enough space, you can see that this supersymmetry transformation on the operators leaves the mean value in the vacuum of those operators invariant. Um, this was something that was uh, pointed out years ago by Coleman, namely that if he called it the symmetry of the vacuum as a symmetry of the world, and what he was doing was essentially this whole problem, certainly in a more general context. Okay. Now, all, uh, so, 
if the supersymmetry, if there's a charge that annihilates the vacuum, then there's a state of zero energy. All the other states have higher energy because the Hamiltonian is positive definite. It's qi squared, or q1 squared, 2q1 squared, say. The q1 is an emission, so it's 2q1 dagger q1. That's a positive definite operator. So all the energies, if super, we'll say, if supersymmetry is exact, then the energies are zero, and then something else as you go up. Okay. Now let's look at what those energies actually are, and um, try to understand something. Um, there's something quite interesting that happens. All right. So let's um, let's first of all solve the problem. Let's try to say, let's try to solve this equation, which is q1 psi equals zero. And notice that what what is this? This is just sigma one p over two root m plus sigma two square root of m w of x, of course. Let me remind you over 2. Psi 0 of x equals 0. Psi 0 being it's a spin. Okay. Um, spin uh, two components. So this is sigma 1 p psi 0 of x is minus sigma 2 m. I should have said m sigma 2. Is, no, I'll just do it. m sigma 2 w of x Size zero of x. Okay. And this is missing an i somewhere. Ah, um, we have a sigma one here and a sigma two there. Um, let me multiply by uh, sigma one. And so I get p psi 0, and let me suppress the x's. p psi 0 equals minus sigma 1, sigma 2, m, w, psi 0. But sigma 1, sigma 2 is i, sigma 3. And so this is minus i, sig uh, sigma 3, m, w, psi 0. I just can never remember to put the m out in front. So finally, what is that? That's p over i psi zero equals m w sigma three psi zero. So this is the equation. And now this equation is very simple. This is just h bar p psi zero dx equals m. Let me write it in W, uh, sigma 3, sigma 0. Well, this is um, my favorite kind of equation. It's a first order differential equation. And we can always solve first order differential equations. And so the answer is, psi 0 of x is e to the m over h bar integral 0 to x dy say w of y sigma 3 acting on psi 0 as 0. And this again is a two component vector. Okay, so this is our um, solution. And so at first sight you might say, well, that means that every supersymmetric quantum mechanical theory has an eigenstate of zero energy because we just found it. But upon further reflection, you realize that this thing has to be normalized if it's going to be an actual quantum state. If instead the norm is infinity, then um, all bets are wrong. And uh, what did we say? Well, we said that the absolute value of W goes to infinity in one way or another. 
And W itself then can do various things. It could be like this, it could be like that, it could be like that, it could be like this. Okay? And so there are these various cases. So I'm going to consider these cases in turn. Um, suppose Wx goes to infinity as x goes to infinity and Wx goes to minus infinity as x goes to minus infinity. So this is one in which W is um, suitably, uh, this is somewhat odd. We'll call this odd W. Well, there are two odd Ws, so this is odd W like that. Um, well, then the state is normalizable because we can just write it this way. Uh, e to the, now I snuck in a minus sign there. That I think is a typo. Is, is it yeah, there's definitely a typo there. Um, so what we've got, let me, let me just write it then this way. M over h bar integral dy from 0 to x, w of y sigma 3, and I'm going to take 0, 1 as the state. You have minus i, because in this equation you have minus i, you just move the i down there, so you have the minus i. Talking about here. Yeah, that's the thing. Okay, well, what I did here was I multiplied. No, you oh, you're right. There is a minus sign. I sigma one to I sigma three. Oh, you're right. I multiply. I should have multiplied by I. But P is h bar over I, so the thing cancels. But you're absolutely right. That's a. Had I finished, had I followed my notes instead of thinking that I could do this. Whoops. Anyway, this is the case. Now what happens? When sigma 3 hits this guy, we get a minus sign. And so what this is, at, and, and it, sigma 3 on, so sigma 3, sigma 3, 0, 1, minus. So consequently, this thing is e to the minus m over h bar 0 to x dy w y 0 1. Okay, now we see what happens. As we go to positive, as we integrate, if we, if we have large values of positive x, this thing gets big, the integral gets huge, we have e to the minus huge. So it's converging. On the other hand, if x, if we integrate to negative x, then um, all the dy's are negative, and consequent, and this thing goes negative huge, and so we have minus, minus, minus. It's still minus, and the thing is is, is uh, converging. So, under these conditions, size zero of x absolute value squared um, has has this shape. It's essentially zero at something or other, and essentially zero. So it's normalizable. Okay. Moreover, but notice we had to pick zero one. It was a unique ground state. Now, if instead we say w of x goes to minus infinity as x goes to infinity, and w of x goes to infinity as x goes to minus infinity. So this is the case where, from your point of view, it looks like this. Um, then what do we do? Well, we say psi 0 of x is e, this is the, gen this is the general solution, m over h bar integral 0 to x dy W of y sigma 3, and now we just pick the upstate. And the upstate means that this thing is e to the m over h bar 
integral 0 to x dy w of y 1, 0 because sigma 3, 1, 0 is 1, 0. Now we do the integral out to positive x. This is negative huge, and so we have e to the minus negative, e to the, e to the minus huge converges. We go to negative values. We have a minus sign here. That's positive. We again have um, something that's converged. On the other hand, if we have a case where, so there's another de Blasio for you, um, but <laughs> second de Blasio, if W of X um, goes to infinity as the absolute value of X goes to infinity or minus infinity as X goes to, as the absolute value of X, in other words, if it looks like this or that, then there's no way to get this to work because uh, no matter what you choose here, you're going to have a problem in one direction or the other. And um, so there's no normalizable state. So in this case, we say that, that there, there is no state that's annihilated by the cubes. And so consequently, we can't go over here and say that we have a symmetry of the vacuum. This, the vacuum is uh, not annihilated by any charge. Ground state is not annihilated. And so u of theta on this ground state is not equal to the ground state itself. Instead, the thing changes. The supersymmetric charge changes the ground state. OK. Now, unfortunately, I stopped my um, notes here in the version that still exists, the erased version now. You can somehow find the erased version. Let me try to um, wing this just a little bit, um, because we, it's, it's actually interesting to look at the other states. Um, and so let me try to figure out how to do this. Um, the excited states come in pairs. And uh, you, 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 you might uh, expect that because, um, well, it's a theory with spin, so you could have spin up, spin down. And in fact, um, that's true. The excited states come in. Uh, the excited states are degenerate in the case of exact supersymmetry. As, as I'm, I'm doing this by memory, unfortunately, as I say, my, my, my um, notes were erased. Um, but let me see. Is it, it's actually not hard to examine these excited states. And... Um, All right, I, I somehow don't remember. There's a trick, though, to show. Um, uh, let's forget. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to think about that. I, uh, all right. Well, let me leave that where it is. Anyway, what you can see here is that because of supersymmetry. You've got a um, you've got the possibility of solving for the ground state at least as a um, a first you you only have to solve a first order differential equation to find the ground state and so you can imagine then generalizing this and in fact we've done this by the way we just did this for arbitrary functions w. So we found for arbitrary, well, within a certain class, but for every function, we have an exact formula for the ground state. That's pretty amazing, because if you consider trying to find the ground state, it's a certain amount of work, even for the simplest case of the harmonic oscillator, then add an arbitrary potential to that. And 
forget it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a numerical problem. And, um, of course, I did this for 1x, but you could do this for x, y, and z. So you could do quantum mechanics in three dimensions and so forth. So there's a whole area here, and um, it's funny. This, this stuff was originally, as I said, invented by Nikolai and Witten, and um, the people who knew about it were all doing quantum field and weren't interested in quantum mechanics, but then it, it leaked out and other people started to apply it. Um, I think somebody even wrote a book on this, um, uh, Supersymmetric Quantum Mechanics, and it, I, uh, well, I'm not an expert in, I haven't read through all the examples of even all the other two of the examples, so I can't tell you how useful it actually is. But it's something to keep in mind in the future. If you're dealing with some quantum mechanical problem, just and it involves spin. There's no spin to get it. But it's, but hell, I mean, you know, electrons have spin, duh. And so non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you want to almost automatically have spin. So it's worth keeping in mind if you have a problem with, say, just a single electron and some kind of a potential, can you convert it to a supersymmetric problem and solve it with just exactly in general with the first order of Okay, so that's um, that's that. I think, I mean, I could lead you through this, but it's just, it just very quickly, unfortunately, as I said, I adopted, I decided to follow the example of these people who do supersymmetry for a living, and they almost all use this dotted, undotted notation, and it gets um, ungodly complicated, I think. And so I thought maybe I should not subject you to that. So let me just tell you roughly what, what is going on. Maybe I can tell you something about the supersymmetry algebra. Um, well, all right, let me, let, me, let me just tell you in general what's going on in quantum field theory. So you have some action density L, and it's um, supersymmetric, say. What does that mean? What it means is that when you do a certain kind of supersymmetry transformation, the change in L is a divergence. So it's a total divergence. And in fact, um, you can then say, well, so you don't, so supersymmetry isn't like ordinary symmetry. In ordinary symmetry, do the symmetry and the action density is invariant. Okay, that's the way we did things. Then you have Noether's theorem. In the case of supersymmetry, you have to do it twice in a sense. You do a, you have a Noether variation and you get a Noether current. You have a, a supersymmetry transformation and you get some other current. J prime mu, and you can then find that the difference of the two currents, um, you can find two currents if the difference of the two currents has zero divergence. And so you get a new current, J, let me call it JQ mu, and that one has actually zero divergence. Then you compute the space integral of J0 of this current, and that's the supercharge. So you get the supercharges that way. And then these supercharges satisfy this remarkable um, algebra. And let me see if I can, that's the trouble. These notes are so long. Um, All right, here we are. Yes, okay. So here is the, the supersymmetry for, unfortunately, this has these dotted and undotted indices, and bar means adjoint in this case. It's not the same as 
the standard bar in the direct sense. And we have a B dot because when you take the adjoint of a num dot and you get a dot. And this stuff is needlessly complicated. Anyway, what you get here is two sigma m a b dot, and this is just these are just the, the Pauli matrices that we used when we talked about two component fields. We had sigma zero was the identity, two by two identity, and then the other three sigmas. And uh, what you have then is this is the four momentum operator of the theory. Okay, so this is the generalization to field theory of the quantum mechanics. There you had the Q squared was the Hamiltonian here. You have basically two superchargers, they are adjoints. The anti-commutator gives you something like the Pauli matrices gotten into the momentum, the four momentum operators. And so you have once again, um, you have these various relations and um, in particular, you can take, you can have this, QA, Q bar A dot. Well, this is actually what we did in quantum mechanics. It's say Q1, Q1 dagger. What is that? That turns out to be four times the Hamiltonian. So you have a relation that's very similar apart from factor two um, to the quantum mechanical case. And that gives you this remarkable situation, that namely, if you have charges, in fact, there's no sum here. This is just one, or am I summing? I may be summing, but it doesn't matter because it's QA squared, which still gives you this. In fact, I, no, I, mean, I should have mentioned that. Anyway, suppose there's a QA that annihilates the vacuum then that state will have zero energy because QA squared is, um, I guess that's 4H or 2H is QA squared annihilates the vacuum, so the energy of the vacuum is zero. And um, so that's that tantalizing situation where all of a sudden you remove supersymmetry, exact supersymmetry removes the worst divergence of quantum field. Um, okay, um, let's see. Maybe I should write down for you what one of these QAs are. And I have it written here in this, as I said, this ungodly dotted and undotted notation. Well, it's DQ dex of something, and it's that J0 that I was telling you about. And this thing is <coughs> sigma m. A, B dot, A and B go from one to two. Sigma bar, zero. B dot C. Psi C, D, M, A bar. A is a spin zero field. Minus I, sigma zero. Of course, sigma zero is just, I mean, this is just essentially the identity. A B dot psi bar B dot W bar prime prime is D by D A. W is called the super potential again, and um, it has to be an analytic function of A. So A can be a complex field and it's an analytic function of that field. Um, when I, since I wrote that thing down, I should say what it is that, um, that, uh, this, this thing is a, uh, an action density for, um, or these are the charges for the left hand, a left-handed chiral theory, and, um, it's chiral in the sense that, well, it's left-handed. Uh, so this thing is I over two derivative a left-handed spinner 
sigma n, n goes from 0 to 3 pi bar. And now I've just written explicitly that I'm mission time pi sigma n dn pi bar minus dn a bar dna. And then there's this thing that one puts in these auxiliary fields. And these fields um, are just in there so that you can do the symmetry in a kind of neat way. F w prime plus F bar w bar prime. And then it's minus a half w double prime pi pi minus a half w bar w prime pi bar. Well, that's the whole theory, and um, the, the charges for that theory, as I said, are these. Um, let me mention how much time? We have a little bit of time left. I'll mention something to you that's really quite amusing, the idea of superspace. Um, it's, it turns out that uh, people doing supersymmetry realized that at some point that they could um, use, a, they, they invented a very compact notation, and it, they called it the superfield notation. Super was just, every other word that these guys spoke was super, and that may have been what ruined the, uh, the SSC in Texas, because you come down to Washington and say you want build a superconducting, super collided, and super expensive, and then at some point kind of super balloon. And so whereas the Europeans at CERN had the grace to simply call it simply the large hadron collider, which is using plain English rather than this super ship English. Okay, so here, what was I about to tell you? Yeah, it's a cute idea. Um, so let me tell you what this, this super field, the, the idea of the super field is. And so let me just skip to that place so that I can um, write it down without screwing up. So let me just, yeah, there we go. It's, it's, it's really quite a cute idea. A field is a function of space-time. Well, a superfield is a function of space-time and Grassmann variables. And um, some people actually, some, some Russian low temperature physicists actually said, well, maybe there's some physical reality underlying the superfield. So maybe space is more than four dimensions of, uh, you know, real numbers, but also has some spinner variables in there. Now, somebody tried to explain to me what, what the experiment was that this guy was doing. I never understood a word of it. Um, I think even the guy came and was in this very room and gave some kind of seminar. I still didn't understand a word of it. But anyway, I can tell you mathematically what this superfield is. So the idea is if you have some function of x and some Grassmann variable and another Grassmann variable, and these are going to be Grassmann spinners. So what is this? Well, it's obviously some function f of x plus theta times some field phi of x plus theta bar uh, pi bar of x plus theta theta and the theta theta just means we this is this the advantage of this undot this dotted and undotted notation is that you can write things without any indices at all and um, the way they show up is this way and this actually means theta lower a phi up a and this is theta bar upper a dot lower psi, chi bar lower a dot and um, 
So this is what happens if you get And you see what happens then is we just write down all the possible combinations So, the simplest base, or the general superphere, let us say, has this form. It's when you expand it out, and now you say, well, you know, what about terms with, with uh, theta cubed? Well, theta only has two components. So if you have a theta cubed, you've got to repeat some component uh, more than uh, once and that gives you zero. Um, so theta cubed is identically zero. Um, so let me, any, anything that was theta cubed would be like C1 theta 1 plus C2 theta 2 cubed. And um, so any term there, you could, theta 1 cubed, that's obviously zero. Theta 2 cubed is 0. But any other term in here would be theta 1 squared, theta 2, or theta 1, theta 2 squared. Those are all 0. So this is identically 0. And higher terms are even worse. So that's why you only get a finite number of terms. And so then the idea was, um, well, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, That's the superfield, and um, so in other words, the superfield has in it, in general, a, um, I guess, a scalar field, a spinner field, another spinner field, uh, a scale, another scalar field, another scalar field. This is a vector field because of the sigma m. And then over here, this is a spin one half, spin one half, and then a spin zero field. So you see it's got all those things built in. And then what's kind of cute is the way in which one constructs actions. Um, damn it, I seem to have skipped that. Um, I think the, the idea basically is that Right, here's what you do. You say your action is an integral of f of x, theta, and theta bar. And now I think the trick is, well, normally you integrate d4 of x, but now you also do d theta, I think the idea was to do d theta, d theta bar. And so then, you automatically build in a, uh, an invariance because if you displace theta or theta bar, um, the action doesn't change. And yeah, I think the reason I'm, I'm, I should have reviewed this, but the trouble was I had so many things to let's review how the how the Grassman integration tables work. This is probably something I should review anyway. So the idea is you let's consider one Grassman variable a single, not not a single spinner, but just a single Grassman variable. So the most general function is f of x would be, um, let us just, f of theta, I'm sorry, leave x out. a plus b theta because the theta squared term is zero. And then we want to, inter we want to figure out what the integral is of theta. And what we want is theta plus key d theta 
should be the same thing as the integral of f of theta d theta. Well, this integral is the integral of a plus b theta plus q chi d theta, right? Because I've changed theta by chi, by chi, and so I've got that. This integral is the integral of a plus b theta d theta. <coughs> so what does this tell you? This tells you if these two things are equal, then this term had better vanish. And that means that the integral d theta is identically zero. Integral d theta bar is identically zero. But the, you can then say what you want with the integral of d theta theta, and we'll set that equal to one. Or, and now, Normally, you have the d thetas and the, and the thetas anti-commute. So you could take this to be 1, or you could say integral theta d theta is 1, and you choose 1 and not both. Okay, otherwise, you get a very simple mathematics if you choose both. Um, and uh, so let me put a minus 1. This is the one I like, I think. And, um, Right, okay. So now, what happens here? Well, if you, if you do a supersymmetry transformation, that means you're changing theta to theta plus chi, say. And then, this is kind of automatically invariant because the theta d theta terms survive, but chi d theta doesn't survive. And so you automatically get a, uh, you can generate uh, theories that have supersymmetry, and you generate them essentially automatically. Um, now, of course, you don't want to work in general with something this complicated. And so what people do is they say, well, we're going to put in certain restrictions. And, um, these restrictions are, for example, um, a chiral superfield. And in this case, chiral superfield looks like this. Phi, well, it's just y and theta, instead of having theta and theta bar. So what can this be? This can be a of y plus root 2 theta psi of y plus theta theta f of y. Now you see this thing is essentially the theory that we were talking about over here. In other words, it's got one fermion, one scalar field, and um, writing it in terms of the superfield gives you something that's um, that's that's a much more compact way of writing it. Um, so that's the that's the chiral superfield. The next one is a vector superfield, and for a vector superfield, um, let me see. Do I have the the field we just wrote it as being? No, apparently just for the B. So this thing looks like this. It's uh, theta sigma m theta bar vm plus i theta 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 bar lambda bar so this is vector field spinner field minus i theta bar theta bar theta lambda of x uh, plus a half theta 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 bar theta bar d of x so this is a field in which you have a scalar field, a spinner field, and a vector field. And um, it, that's the, the superfield formula. So one has to admit that this superfield notation is, is very nice. And it, of course, would be very interesting if somebody could um, come up with uh, some 
experiment to tell us whether this is just mathematical notation gone wild or whether it's something physical. And, uh, the problem, though, with... Oh, um, let me just... Well, we're sort of at the end of the hour. I mean, we're beyond the end of the hour. Uh, the, the, these... The ground state energy, let me just remind you what it is. It's basically m squared plus k squared dqk. This is the thing for a single scalar field that gives you infinity to the four. And so then what you have is you have minus square m prime squared plus p squared dqp. So you have a fermion mode that cancels. If the symmetry is exact, the masses are exactly the same and you have zero as the ground state energy. But if there's a little bit of um, difference, then what happens is the worst part of the divergence cancels. The worst part is the k squared dqk, the p squared dqp, that cancels. The one that doesn't cancel is something like, um, it's um, what? You pull out the, the k. In other words, this, what does this look like? This looks, this is an integral of k dqk square root of 1 plus m squared over k squared minus an integral square root of 1 plus m prime squared over p squared P D Q P. Okay, so the worst part obviously cancels, and the part that doesn't cancel is down by two orders. So it's a, it's infinity squared rather than infinity to the four, and that of course is a huge improvement. And there was some hope that, in, in fact, it's even true that if you break supersymmetry softly by something like a Higgs mechanism or some other thing, uh, some other mechanism, you can arrange that the sum of the squares of the boson masses is the same as the sum of the squares of the fermion masses. And then the quadratic divergent goes away. You just have a logarithmic divergence. And then you can introduce another ident uh, requirement that the sum of the fourth powers of the masses or the bosons cancels the sum of the fourth problem, and then you've got a finite theory. Um, and who knows, maybe that's the way the world is. And um, you might say, but we haven't found any of those, we've got all this dark matter out there. Maybe, um, maybe the supersymmetric particles are all dark. I, it's probably impossible to make that work. But um, otherwise, we would have heard about it because the supersymmetry people are always good at promoting supersymmetry. Um, anyway, well, well, is that a question? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, is there any relation between this super field and the Kegel global equation? I'm sorry, say that again? I mean, in, in the Kegel global equation, your equation, you have. In the, in the what? Your equation, the Kegel global equation. Kegel global equation? You don't know that? The Cahill Glauber equation? You don't know that? I don't know that. You really don't know that? <laughs> so it's the, Fourier, the Grassmannian Fourier transform of the density matrix, that equation. That, that. You mean the P representation or the S order density? So, so, so in that theory, you are doing a. Uh, you are doing the Fourier transform of the exactly analog to the Wigner function, but instead of the normal Fourier transform, you have the Fourier transform of the Grassmannian variable. You really don't know. That. Um, <laughs> it's I, all right. Let's let's. Why don't we stop the tape and um, talk about this afterwards? Um, so, so say again.